Best Book Bits podcast brings you Alan Mallory, international speaker, author, and performance coach who is passionate about leadership and reaching new heights in all that we do. His unique philosophy of life revolves around empowering people and embracing an agile mentality focused on goals and results. Alan holds a degree in engineering and a master's in psychology, giving him a well-balanced approach to the outer and inner challenges we all face. In the spring of 2008, Alan embarked on a journey of a lifetime and set a world record on Mount Everest with three members of his immediate family. Alan is the author of The Family That Conquered Everest and Summit of Self, The Seven Peaks of Personal Growth. Alan, thanks for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Michael. Good to be here. Now, well, that's a a life resume. So take us back to 2008, a two-month Mount Everest expedition through some of the most exciting yet terrifying conditions. What made you and your family tackle Mount Everest? Well, this was an expedition that I I took part in along with my brother, uh, father, and sister, and mother. My mother was there as well. She she actually tore her Achilles tendon just above base camp and had to abandon her climb. Um, but I would say my father really got us into mountaineering to begin with. You know, he he instilled that um, adventuresome spirit, and, and I'd say the, the the mentality of set lofty goals in life and 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 don't let too much get in the way of of making them a reality. And so it's not like mountaineering is the only um, endeavor we've been involved with, but it's kind of um, you know, it was definitely one of the, the, the would say, the climax of some of a, of a lot of the other adventures that prepared us for something like that, because it was two years of planning and, and two months of actual um, climbing and uh, through some horrific challenges, you know, 50 plus seemingly bottomless crevasses every time we go through the Kumbu Icefall, for example, and we have to go through that six times and lots of vertical sections. And, and then there's the, the kind of biological and physiological challenges from the reduced immune function that you get at altitude. And then there's just the mental challenges of being there for two months and and having to survive through all of that. So I would say we had some advantages being a a family and we looked out for each other that much more than a random climber and, and we'd already built the trust and we got along pretty well. It's not like we never had conflicts, but we didn't, you know, allow them to escalate to the point where they would, uh, destroy the, the the relationships and the team and everyone's kind of on their own at that point and and we would never had a chance of reaching the summit so yeah awesome yeah take it where, whereabouts did you grow up and sort of was you always into mountaineering as a family and what did you get up to sort of in your early years prepping you for obviously climbing mount everest with the family not many families can sit around the dinner table and say you know we we conquered mount everest that's that's sort of a bit crazy well it was our lifestyle that prepared us and i grew up just north of toronto in ontario canada and we just did a lot of outdoor activities and uh and so instead of going to the beach or or on a all-inclusive vacation or to disney world or whatever the typical um you know <laughs> normal family let's use the word, let's use that wording um, does we would often be doing some sort of winter camping or whitewater canoeing or or something like that that's a multi-day trip and and um and so it really you know got us very interested in the outdoors but also i would say allowed each of us to develop those survival skills if we can say or or at least extreme problem solving skills that you need on a mountain when you have very volatile a very volatile environment that's throwing challenges you've never faced before at you and you need to be able to extrapolate from the ways that you've solved the problems in the past in order to find a way to continue forward yeah i guess going back to your sort of academic and professional career you're a professional engineer talk about sort of how that sort of unfolded and yeah it gives a little bit of background to your academic and professional career yeah well it's uh, i have a bit of an odd uh, let's say educational background in that my undergraduate is in mechanical engineering and so i'm I'm quite technical minded from uh in that sense and and i would say some of that is what what uh led to the mental health challenges that i had in in my younger years which is when we get to talking about my my new book is really what that's all about kind of making incremental improvements but you know I, i really understood the technical side and was able to analyze things but didn't understand the human mind very well and um and I think that's typical for a lot of people that are really technically minded. You know, the social skills aren't there. The, the, the emotional intelligence is lacking, things like that. And so um, 
because of the mental health challenges it went through, and in my case, uh, it was in high school, I developed quite a severe uh, social phobia and anxiety disorder, which is known as generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. Uh, and it really morphed into depression after a lot of years of kind of living in my own mind and playing those mental movies over and over again um, of, of past disasters or envisioning future disasters. But, but eventually I decided, look, this is sucking most of the enjoyment out of living. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not really living at all other than in my own mind. Um, I'm going to do whatever it takes to figure this out. And so that's when I started studying the, the human mind. And a lot of it for the you know first bunch of years was self-education, getting my hands on the books that talked about what I was going through so I could make those, those deeper cognitive changes or, and develop the strategies that work for me. Um, so, but then I formalized it a little bit in that it, it became quite a passion of mine. So I went on to get my master's in, in psychology, um, which is kind of rare, I guess you could say, for, a, for an engineer because they're, they're almost polar opposites in, the, in terms of the education. <laughs> Um, journey. But I have found that's really made me a more well-balanced uh, individual and, in, in, you know, not just my, my uh, formalized studies, but, you know, understanding personality and individual differences. And um, it started with understanding myself and my own personality and what I was predisposed to. Um, but then it's very actionable or translatable when it comes to interpersonal relationships. And so I found that's really been quite beneficial in, in you know, on a, in a broader sense in my life. We'll really sort of get into it and unpack it. So the book you wrote, Summit of Self, The Seven Peaks of Personal Growth, you really sort of open up the inner mountains we face and, you know, the disasters as well. You talk about, yeah, your success with Mount Everest and the mountaineering and all that as well. But one of the first stories you talk about is a conference that you talk about where, you know, a true story that actually never happened. It was in your own mind and you would on end rehearse disastrous outcomes in high definition clarity in your mind. And, and you talk about you were stuck in a never ending cycle of relentlessly tuning out mental movies one after another. Do you want to tell us a story about that? Even though you sort of climbed Mount Everest, you, you know, wasn't able to, you were daunted by this emotional mountain that you were imagining. Can you unpack that a little bit uh, with the audience? Well, that's kind of what it started with me is, is I developed a social phobia and I, I, I adopted a lot of avoidance mechanisms. Uh, but the problem with avoidance mechanisms is that our minds flag those instances as threats, even though we haven't actually gone through them. It's like the, 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 the story I share at the beginning of, of the book. You know, I would have lots of those, but you're kind of just training your mind to, to, to recognize those instances as, as threats, even though there's nothing really uh, threatening about them. And that's not uncommon for, for um, you know, people to develop those types of uh, social phobias and um, you know a lot of people you know is, there's different severities you know when they when they poll individuals you know something like public speaking is usually ranks I think according to the statistics higher than the fear of death <laughs> and so but at my in my case it, it was quite severe and really when it became most problematic I mean it, it affected my my life in that I was avoiding a lot of situations um, social situations and things like that. Um, when I, when I, especially when I thought there was kind of a, an authority figure, and 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 I had time to kind of, the anticipatory anxiety, I had time to play those mental movies, and already have have pre-developed the disasters before that even happened. And then when it actually went through it, it was just um, basically uh, an automatic cycle that that uh, uh, that my my mind and body went <laughs> went through, and it was just this downward cycle into anxiety and, and panic and and uh, the, the the classic fight or flight uh, responses. Um, so that's what um, kind of, you know, that's how it, that's how it all started. But then when it really, when it morphed into generalized anxiety disorder, um, that's when it really became problematic and scary for me because, you know, really what, what GAD is, is you, you, you stop needing a trick, you stop needing a a trigger. You stop needing it, even though in my case, a lot of times the trigger was a, a, a mental movie or something that I was, I was envisioning. That's we call it episodic future thinking, um, which is actually very beneficial in, in plotting our way through life and avoiding sit, real situations that are dangerous to us. But it's uh, in the mind of the of a phobic, it's very um, problematic because we're creative. We can just envision countless future scenarios. Uh, to try and try to 
um, identify all the paths that could possibly lead to that which we most fear, let's say. And so, um, and, and so that's what was happening with me. Now, once the generalized anxiety disorder takes over, you, don't, or you no longer need the trigger. It's just the, the sensations and the, and the, and the realization and the, of, the, of the symptoms trigger additional symptoms. And so it's, it's, it's fully a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. Um, and, uh, and so that's, and that's a scary place to be because you're kind of just, you know, stuck in that noticing and, and it's just, it's feeding that, that, uh, cycle of anxiety and, and, and panic. And you feel pretty hopeless when you're stuck in that. And that's, uh, that's where I was. And at certain times it was very, very bad. Um, really the more distracted I was, the less it, it was a, a, a real problem. But when I would be left to my own mind and that's when it would, I would go down these, these uh, really cycles and, and that morphed into depression, just kind of hating that, that part of me and finding very little joy in, in very much. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's, you know, that's how it transpired for me until I, I started doing something about it. Yeah. And you really go into it in the book, obviously, you know, with the loops and scripts, I call it sort of, we play these mental loops and we, we play these mental scripts and sometimes they become really, really high walls and we just go round and round and round. And yeah, you open up to obviously the road to recovery for yourself and an understanding of what the anxiety and depression that led to it as well. Talk about a personal experience, you and your dad mountain bike riding and coming across a gentleman named Tim in the book. Do you want to talk about sort of what happened with Tim, it was a real sort of touching story of, of what you go into on the book. Yeah, well, I, I started with that because the more I, there was a few instances that, that allowed me to realize that you know, I wasn't alone in the, in the struggle and, and, you know, people, a lot of people, we, we don't want to, you know, we, we, we adopt these facades, you know, we want everyone to, and social media has exacerbated it to some degree, you know, you, you look on there and you think, well, everyone's just living a great life and uh, I'm the only one in the world that has any challenges. And, uh, and it's just not true. And the more that I, I speak at a lot of conferences and often there's people that, um, especially now that I'm doing more and more mental health programs and, you know, not so much just telling her or ever a story, um, you know, people all the time coming after me, uh, coming up after me and, and kind of sharing their journey or about their kids or about their, you know, other relatives that have, have struggled through that and kind of looking for, looking for, uh, looking for answers. So th that, that story, it's a true story. Uh, although I, ch I changed his name just for the anonymity, but, um, yeah, we were biking in the, in the forest near where my, my parents live and it was early. It was the first mountain bike of the year. And we came across, um, uh, a young man and he had a rope around his neck and it was over the limb of a tree. And, uh, and you know, he was, he was trying to end his life. And, and so we, I guess, Fortunately, we're there at the right time and we started talking with him and, and we were able to kind of calm him down and, and uh, he told us a little bit about his story and the things he was going through and work and school and all of that. And, um, and so then we, um, we kind of escorted him most of the way home, although then we had to kind of part with him and, and we kind of watched to make sure he wasn't going back to the woods. It's not like we could... You know, it's not like he couldn't have t turned around, but um, I had kind of shared a little bit about my journey and I, I offered to send him some information and, and I wrote quite a, afterwards quite a lengthy email to him. And um, and we also, we thought, well, you know, we, we our little discussion and everything, it's not really going to be enough to, you know, change everything in his life. And so he could easily revert back and try some, something like that the next day. And so um, we did in the end, actually my father um, reached out to a few people who knew, who knew kind of in the mental health and, um, you know, he hadn't talked to, any, to anyone about it, uh, including his, his father's family. And, and so through the school system, at least he was able to get some, I was afraid it would, it would further alienate him, but he actually did thank, thank me in the end for kind of, you know, bringing it to light and, and, and the school was able to get him some, um, some help and assessment there and you know i haven't kept in, in touch with them but I, I hope it's you know sometimes it's a you know small little things can can alter the trajectory and and put you on an upward path which is kind of the underlying theme of that book you know make find ways of making small incremental improvements in in your life and, and here's some of the strategies that that i learned and developed and, and use yeah, one of the things I got from that uh, story as well was that you opened up to him as well and you were open and raw and 
you know, sometimes we face those moments in life where these are these are real situations and how, how we respond to those situations as well. So, yeah, you really go into it in the book and, yeah, real touching story as well. So mental health affects uh, a lot more people than we actually discuss. It's one of those things swept under the rug uh, until someone sort of talks about it and opens up their shared sort of experience. Moving on in the book, obviously, you, you go through quite a bit in the book, which is great. You talk about sort of the anxiety uh, feedback loop, which we touched on that already, which is, you know, thoughts turns into emotional responses then the emotional responses turn into physical responses and they dictate our sort of our behavioral responses as well and it's just this loop we go through but starting with the book you talk about the summits and the first summit is self-knowledge and you talk about the the highest mountain in north america as well and when you normally do speaking gigs and you do conferences people ask you know why on earth would anyone want to put themselves through such a climb and and why do it and the famous mountaineer in three words Ah, what are those three famous mountaineering words? Because it's there. <laughs> it's there. Do you want to talk about why? Because it's there and and why people like yourself, mountaineering, do these type of things? And, and what is the summit of self-knowledge, the first one? Well, it's the summit of self-knowledge is all about introspection. I would say it starts there, under, understanding yourself. Now, the, you know, because it's there, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek answer. And I, I would say, um, you know, for me... I've thought about that, you know, why did I want to attempt Everest uh, to begin with? And I've been through a lot of different Everests in life and my, my internal Everest, as I, as I call it, in terms of mental health is, you know, just another one and, and I'll have more. And so it's a, it's a journey of self-discovery, I would say more than anything. And, um, you know, can I push my mind and my body to that limit and, and, and be successful in the end? Um, so, you know, I kind of, after I move on from, um, from that quote, um, you know, I talk about, you know, what, you know, why did I go through this journey, the mental, the mental health and improvement journey? And, uh, I, I say, because I, I'm here. I mean, there's a lot of people who are kind of negative and say, well, you know, what's the point of all of this? And, and if you look, take a um, philosophical dive and you say well we're pretty insignificant in the in the grand scheme of the universe is there anything we can do on on earth that's meaningful and 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 that's kind of what that quote is getting at well you're here you kind of get one kick at the can let's say in, in terms of your life here on on earth and so you might as well try to make the the, the most of it you know maybe in 100,000 years it's not going to make much difference but it, it takes just, you know, you, you have to, you're here anyway. It, it takes just as much energy, you could say, to do things wrong as it does to do things right. So you might as well try to try to be the, the, the best you can be and, and, and become the best influence you can be. And, um, and I think that's a, you know, a, a good ap approach to life. It certainly, you know, leads to a lot more meaningful life. And, uh, you know, try to make those incremental improvements. And, um, and it starts with, with yourself. You know, a lot of, the, we've kind of been, been raised with this, um, you know, it's a, it's a well-meaning thing, you know, kind of putting others in, in, in ahead of you. And, but, but a lot of people take that to the extreme and kind of, it, 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 it's self-neglect and, and people like, you know, kind of hate themselves and, and, and um, you're not really doing anyone a favor, including yourself, when you when you adopt that mentality of, of, of self neglect, and I would say, you know, start with yourself, start understanding, start making those improvements in yourself, and then you can be, then you're that much more in a better place. You have a foundation where you can, you can be more influential in you, in in uh, other people's lives. So. Yeah, some of the notes I got from that was, yeah, definitely in introspection, you know, spending time with yourself and, and self-discovery, finding out who you are, making the most out of life. I like what you said, the same amount of energy to do the wrong things. And I think people forget that, you know, we're, we're, we're here, you know, we might as well do make the most of it. Like we're literally here. Our bodies have grown. We've spent all these years on getting where we are and people just sort of fall into the funk of mediocrity and, uh, you know, what was me mentality where... Hang on a second. Just that that slight little shift, a couple of degrees, can really change the trajectory of your life as well. And making those incremental improvements, like you know, if, if you get 
not one percent better, but if, if if you're trying to these small little wins add up to big wins as well. So just trying to get those little wins too. Uh, in the book, you go through becoming your sort of own therapist as well, uh, which is definitely what what the book's about. And you talk about sort of the the big five personality traits. So we'll touch on those a little bit. So the big five personality traits is sort of openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticisms. Do you want to expand on any of those uh, personality traits? Well, that's a way of kind of quantifying your understanding of, of yourself to some degree. And so, and so, um, and I found it's like, there's a lot of different personality assessments out there, the Myers-Briggs, the True Colors, Enneagram, and, and I've taken a lot of them. And, um, but I really like the, the, the big five and, and it's, you know, one of the reasons is it, it, it was, um, it wasn't derived from a theory per se, it was derived from actual um, statistic analysis. And so they, they did uh, analysis of actual personality questionnaires and uh, determine, okay, is, the, is there, it's called a factor analysis, a statistical analysis, is there a common factor? Because you can kind of ask the same question in different ways. And if you've ever, um, if listeners have ever, you know, rented a, a, a car or taken a flight and they don't know what they're doing in, a, in a, their survey, that's exactly what the survey is. Did you enjoy your, your, your rental? Are you likely to rent from us again? Are you likely to, how likely are you to, to uh, recommend us to the friends? Well, if you answer number one out of five for the first, you kind of answer the same because they're all about the same factor. And what that is, is, is overall satisfaction, you could say. And the same thing is with personality. And so that's what happens. You factor analyze it and you find out you get the big five. And so um, I like that aspect of it, that it's more of a scientific approach. Um, and then it's just fascinating how it's been used to, to predict all kinds of different life outcomes. Now, you have to look at the, the strengths of the correlations because like any um, psychometric, it's not particularly strong, but they're, they're significant. And so you can kind of identify where your, your, your strengths are, but, but more importantly, where your weaknesses are. And um, especially when, you, when you've kind of chosen a vocation in life, there'll be certain personality distribution, uh, distributions that are, are more advantageous. And, and, um, and that's where I think it's, it's important. Um, you know, now I've really worked on, and I'm, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but uh, given my trajectory in life and the path I chose, you know, I, I'm naturally an introvert and, you know, I've worked on becoming more extroverted and, um, and you could say I'm still naturally an introvert because, because when I go to a party, if, it, you know, if you're energized afterwards, that's kind of the telltale sign of you're extroverted. People kind of bring you energy. If you need me time afterwards, you're, you're more introverted and I still kind of have to unwind. Um, but actually when I take the assessment, I score fairly high in extroversion now because a lot of it is, you know, what, you know, it's, it depends how the word, how it's worded really, but you know, are you more likely to do this or that? And now I really seek out those, those experiences and enjoy and generalizing, enjoy them. Um, so that's the, some of the ways that I, I've really used it, um, in, in my life to, to identify my, my weaknesses and, and make changes. Also, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, it can give you an idea of why there's friction in, in certain uh, points, because when you start to recognize the, the characteristics in people um, based on, the, based on their, their personality distribution, then you, you can adjust your interactions to some degree. And so that's the, the practical um, benefit of it. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I found it quite practical and, and quite interesting. Like, luckily I'm, I'm very interested in it to begin with, but, um, but so throughout the book, I, I kind of, you know, to, uh, you know, I, I bring, I bring back the, the big five personality at various points to kind of give people as they're thinking through and reading through the analogies to give them an idea of, you know, where they might be predisposed to certain actions or certain behaviors or certain thoughts um, based on their own personality distribution. And they don't have to actually take an assessment because I, th I include the, a table in there and you can kind of, you know, get a feel for it based on what the extremes are and where you, where you, where you fall. Um, and so you get a feel for, are, are my you know, high in conscientiousness or very low or where do I fall in openness? So, yeah, no, thanks for explaining that and expanding on that as well. But yeah, you, you go into it uh, a little bit in the book as well. Moving on some of the other things you talk about, I like one of the quotes in the book, it talks about, it's not what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's what we know for sure 
which just ain't so. You go on to talk about cognitive diffusion. What is cognitive diffusion and how can we use this sort of technique? Well, yeah, cognitive diffusion, it's a, you know, I should really credit the, who, who I think in the book I do, who, who it's part of ACT, the accept, acceptance commitment uh, therapy or something like that. Um, yeah, Stephen Hayes, yeah. And um, so, but there, I'd say there's different versions of it and, and it's hard to say who, who comes up with, with these originally, but certainly kind of coining the name. Uh, but it's it's really a mindfulness practice. But why I found it really quite, what I say, a pivotal time in my mental health journey is, you know, I, I was I was pretty, you know, I had a lot of negative thought, automatic thought patterns, and so I would try to force them out of my. You know, I don't want to think about that. You know, force it out of my mind. But we're curious individuals, and if you tell yourself, don't think of pink elephants first thing that comes into your mind is a pink elephant. And, and that's kind of the same with ne negative thoughts. You know, they'll just keep coming back. And it, it's it's exhausting and futile to, to try to rid your mind of, of thoughts. Uh, so the cognitive diffusion isn't that. It's, it's allowing those thoughts to be, but emotionally disconnecting yourself from, from the, those thoughts is, is how I would put it. You know, taking a step back. And I would kind of see those thoughts as something well is other than me and, and to some degree there's truth in that because a lot of those automatic thought patterns are instilled in us from our caregivers and parents and educators and all of that and so it's not that um bizarre i guess to think of the thoughts as as something uh, almost separate than you and so um i wouldn't emotionally engage with them in in, in but when I practice that, and that's really what the cognitive diffusion is, kind of see them as separate, don't emotionally engage, because once you start questioning and, and analyzing and beating yourself up, you go down that, that spiral, and um, it kind of <laughs> has you at that point. And so I just kind of see them as something se separate than me, allow them to, to kind of float through my, my mind. And I had different versions of it, and I still use it at times. Um, but I would often combine it, combine it with the visualization where I kind of see the, the, the thoughts floating in from one side of my head through my ear and then uh, out the other. And, um, and so that's what it is. It's a, it's a mindfulness technique. To help us through life. Yeah, what I got from that, it was emotionally disconnecting your thoughts and not allowing them to dominate or hijack your mental energy and behavior. Because what happens is a lot of our thoughts will stop us behaving. Yeah, we might get into this mental rut and, and it will drain our mental energy, but they'll actually stop us from behaving. And then segueing into the next one, you talk about start climbing. So you can't get to the summit just by sitting and thinking about what route to take. You've got to climb and you can't avoid the tough parts of the route as well, which moves us on to sort of the, the summit of self-motivation, which is the next one. You talk about two kinds of people and they are people with either extrinsic motivation or intrinsic motivation. Can you elaborate on that and, and what's the difference? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's, it's one or the other. Like all of us are, some of us are more intrinsically motivated and some of us are more extrinsically motivated. But I'd say in general, we, we're, we're, we're all affected by both. But certainly in, in, intrinsic is, is for the, um, and I'm very in, intrinsically motivated. You know, a lot of the things that I've um, done in my life, it's for that kind of, and I, I touched on it earlier, that satisfaction and proving to myself that I can and proving to myself that I, that I can be a little bit better than I was the last time I did a race for, for, for example, um, where uh, people that are, you know, don't have much intrinsic motivation at all and they're extrinsically motivated. They need rewards. They need, um, pats on the back. They need cheerleaders to kind of, um, uh, spur them on. So, um, now, what's interesting, and I, and, and I talk a little bit about it, uh, I think it's in that chapter, is, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we can all think of people that we say, oh, this person, they just have zero inner drive, and they're just kind of floating through life. And, um, and one of the motivational theories, is that McGregor, I forget which one I, I share in there, that's, he, he kind of separates the, the, the people into X and Y, and those that need, that are self-motivated, and those that, that aren't. But what I've also noticed is sometimes people they kind of just need a mentor in life or, or they, something changes in their life and they, or, they, or they find something they're really passionate about and it's like the light bulb, the light switch gets turned on and they, they suddenly become more intrinsically motivated. And so it's, I wouldn't say you can, you can so much say, well, this person's a lost cause. And 
since it's about summits of self, when you're trying to make your own self uh, a little bit better, um, it's about finding those those strategies that allow you to be more intrinsically motivated in 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 pursuing those things that are going to make a difference in your in your life. And so, um, and then I go into some of the strategies that that uh, that I've used in in terms of because I'm not always you know motivated to. To, to take on very various things and and then there's also a chapter on self resilience and often I'm even less mo- less motivated to kind of pick myself up when when things go badly and so in both those areas we can make changes and, and adopt strategies that really are going to be helpful and that's exactly what I mean. I talk about accountability partners and, and things like that yeah and you also talk about obviously the avoidance motivation as well how we 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 sort of there's a reverse motivation as well where we can sort of talk ourselves out of doing things as well and understanding you know maslow's hierarchy of needs and just getting back to um getting back to balance which segues into the next summit you talk about summit number three which is the the summit of self-balance and the importance of of balance and and self-acceptance can you touch on that a little bit about self-balance well that chapter i you know i open i open all the chapters this kind of i'd say an entertaining adventure story but then i talk about you know that if we if we wanted to talk about well what balance do we need in our life like it's so broad you could have a 10 books just written on that and so i i talk just so i don't um make people think that the only thing you need is psychological balance i kind of open it with talk about physical um, health and all of that but really the, the the focus of that chapter is on the psychological balance between being too um self uh what's the wording i use it's really t- too driven um and too kind of self-accepting where you kind of just float through life um self-discipline that was the word i was searching for and um and i've been, i've kind of naturally more on the self-discipline side and i'm fairly high in conscientiousness and so that that uh helps but um there are strategies you can use for both of those and certainly i really found it hard in my younger years to go to the beach and just kind of sit there and relax like i'd be fidgeting and what can i be doing what adventure can i do what can i be accomplishing and so i was way too far on the self-discipline side and so i consequently i realized i had to get the balance back and so um i started doing yoga and and that's when i started trying different meditation techniques and things like that and i would say i've done a pretty good job at getting that balance back there's lots of people on the other side that are you know just way too lackadaisical in, in their, their their approach and need to develop the self-discipline and, and so and in some way in some areas i'm there as well you know i just i find i'm not i'm not uh, self-disciplined so it's like you can work on both um and uh and so the strategies particularly in that chapter are around um how to develop self-discipline if you are someone that just you know you find you you just don't have that self-discipline and, and it's, which isn't uncommon and it's kind of a um, um, depleting asset <laughs> to some degree and so you, you we can't be 100 percent self-disciplined in everything uh, so it's it's making sure we we direct our energy towards those things that matter um, but there's also some strategies i share in there on, on i would say how to um, start with a start with a of a, a, more full tank of your self-discipline tank, uh, so to speak. And I like how you talk about optimum performance in the book as well, because at the end of the day, it's about managing good stress and bad stress and managing performance and arousal level too. So if your arousal level is low, then obviously your performance level is low. Now, if your arousal level is high with high stress, then obviously your performance is going to decrease as well. So it's that balance between having good stress and bad stress and optimally performing and and going through the unknowns of the day too so if we avoid the unknowns and we avoid you know conversations or particular actions or we avoid stress and we don't put ourselves in those environments where we know we need to perform and take action then we're just going to get sort of mental lethargic and you know not sort of hitting our goals and pushing things forward so there comes a point where yeah you can be balanced you know you've slept right you've had your coffee You've got a warm belly, as they call it. You know, you've got food in your belly. You've got to do something with your life. You've got to do something with your day. So don't avoid the actions of the day. So I like how you, you wrote in the book about how to maintain that optimum optimum performance as well. Is there anything you want to add on to that before we move on? 
Well, only that I would say as a society, we haven't been doing a very good job of, of encouraging people, especially students, to be self-disciplined. And that's almost why, you know, it's important for, for people to take it into their own hands. Um, you know, if anything, we've just kind of been encouraging uh, students in particular, you know, you, you know, you, Whatever happens, happens. I mean, you're you're don't don't bother trying to improve yourself. You're okay. You're okay as as you are. And there is an aspect, and that's why it's a balance. You know, you don't want to be always beating yourself up. And so, in some ways, you need to be somewhat okay with yourself. But but I I don't think it's healthy to just to accept whatever is. And what, it's 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 prudent to to identify areas where you need to to um, improve and to take the steps in in, in making that. Um, we, you know, we've we've kind of it's the bubble wrap approach we've taken as a society, and trying to you know save people from adversity. Adversity is what allows us to grow and allows us to um, you know better ourselves. And and if you look at it from a, a psychological perspective, that that's the, the treatments that work are are are. Uh, and I, I talk a little bit about it when I talk about um, kayaking. But it's that voluntary expo exposure therapy. Uh, it's not from never having to go through the adversities. It's from getting to yourself to the point mentally and, and physically where you can face that adversity, learn from it, and 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 um, bring that into other challenges of your life. Yeah, it's not a, it's not escaping the the challenges or the stresses in life. It's about you know, having the, the confidence and tools and, and know how to overcome those as well. Going into Summit 4, you talk about the Summit of Self-Regulation and you talk about a, a little story of swimming with the manta rays. Do you want to touch on that? Well, this was an exciting... The first time I, my wife and I visited Hawaii, um, we ended up doing... There's kind of a... it's a, There's a commercial way of seeing these manta rays. They, they sh shine these bright lights in the in the ocean at night and they, they come in to get the, the, the plankton, these enormous, you know, the ones we saw were, I forget how, but they're, you know, often they're six feet and their wingspan. And, uh, and so we don't really like the, the organized tours. And so we decided to figure out how we can do it ourselves. We rented the dive lights, but it was pretty eerie um, <laughs> at night trying to, because we couldn't enter where, right where the manta rays were. We had to enter in this dark bay and swim our way around. Uh, with these little dive lights and so i talk about <laughs> that story and it was certainly freaked both of both of us out and we almost talked ourselves out of do, uh, out of doing it and there was part of us that wanted to to uh, avoid that but you know in, in some way we faced our our fears and that's what the the story is is all about and we just felt great afterwards and of course it was a, a fantastic um experience um but i think it's important to face your fears when they're irrational fears and um, and often they are when they're uh, psychological in nature, and so it's just kind of a you know a fun story, and we we we've often thought <laughs> thought back to that experience um, th that opens the chapter. So yep. yeah, so I well I talk about it in the context of uh, of whitewater kayaking because I had a real scare. Um, one of the times when I was whitewater kayaking, and it really, you know, kind of when we have these these scares and they can morph and affect other areas of our, our lives, especially if we avoid adopt the avoidance mechanisms. And, and I had to some degree, um, you know, I hadn't been kayaking after that instance for quite a while. And so every time I thought of it, I had anxiety about uh, about that. And so how I work through that is similar to how um what's been shown to be the the i'd say the most effective in, in overcoming any kind of uh, phobia which is uh exposure therapy and not forced exposure therapy by someone else but voluntary on your on your own and so that's what i had to do is go back to the rapid and in, in, in that same one and, and and kind of go through it now there's more gradual ways of doing so and you can depending on the listeners if anyone has a phobia you can you know start by just watching a movie about whitewater kayaking, looking at a picture of whitewater kayaking, you kind of work your way up. And any kind of phobia, that's exactly really what is, is recommended. If you have a phobia of spiders and, um, and it matters to you to, to not have that affect your life, 
um, then before you go to the zoo and start uh, handling tarantulas, uh, you start by looking at pictures and kind of breathing through that and working your way up. But, um, but that is how you, you would overcome a, a fear of spiders. Um, they, you know, it's, it's been shown again and again. And, and that's again, comes back to why it's so concerning to, to encourage people to just um, avoid situations that, that are going to cause them discomfort. Because you're just cementing that that uh, anxiety and, and, and phobia in, in people's mind by encouraging something like that. So it's uh, that's what the the exposure therapy is all about. Yeah, I think it leads on to cognitive distortions where sort of when we have a phobia, our natural tendency is to minimize our perceived ability to cope with the stimulus uh, and maximize our perceived failures. So, you know, we think so much about why we can't cope and really realistically it's just a bit off balance as well so cognitive distortions um is what you talk about as well you know the opening story that's exactly what you know it was uh i had a lot of cognitive distortions and it's worth identifying you know, understanding them so you can identify them in your own life yeah and you, you go through it as well with regulating the emotions as well so obviously you've got response appraisal attention situation and it's all about how do you what, what is your feedback loop as well and this this segues into mindfulness so obviously in all of this a key is to pay attention and aware of what's going on with you as well you know focus on you know mindfulness some people are skeptical on this method but um, yeah do you want to talk about your experience with sort of mindfulness mindful breathing i've sort of gone into the practice myself of learning to pause reflect put the current to reverse and just say you know what if you can control your breath you can control your moment if you control your moment you can control the your actions and your life as well. So talk about the importance of mindfulness and breath. Yeah, well, I mean, we already talked a little bit earlier about cognitive diffusion, which is really a mindfulness technique, but it, it's about, um, you know, mindfulness in general is about being present and kind of, you know, noticing the sensations and so on around you. And so, um, you, you know, I start, there, there's quite a few practical strategies at the end of that chapter, but the, the, the most basic is just kind of, you know, observing your, your, your breath and, and, it's, it allows you to regulate your own body um, and you can kind of do that anywhere. And that's the, the advantage when, if you're in a stressful situation, you know, bring your attention to your breath, you know, slow down your, your breathing. Um, so then I go through a few other ones uh, that are, are, you know, still simple, but maybe a little bit more uh, advanced on the progressive muscle relaxation, for example, that I, um, I used to use a lot and still do at times, you know, if I'm having trouble sleeping in, in particular, I go through that that mental um, exercise of you know relaxing and 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 you know picturing each muscle group and 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 I even use a, a verbal um, you know saying kind of my 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 foot feels heavy my foot feels heavy and really kind of picturing it and to 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 relax my whole body. So and there's a few other strategies that I share in there. Yeah, there's heaps you go through. One of the ones I like was rewriting the ending, and this is about sort of going through, you know, past scenarios that we associated troublesome with, and it's sort of reframing those in a third person perspective and walking through those perspectives in in a sequence and, and rewriting the ending, uh, which is really really great. Moving on to sort of summit five, you talk about the the summit of self respect as well, and talk about authentic authenticity uh with yourself dignity and respect setting the rules responsibility and and the victim mentality and then you talk about uh, the story with adam's journey which which is your brother so you want to touch on any of those things that i just said that would be great you know there's a lot in that chapter but it starts with um well maybe i'll talk about my brother's journey first i mean he he, he was you know quite young was was uh you know identified with a learning disability and and it kind of put on that path in terms of um a different education path and my parents didn't think he was even going to graduate from from high school and it was interesting and i would say my mother had a lot of quite quite an influence in this kind of encouraging him to find out what worked for him um and he did you know at, at one point he he kind of took it on himself to 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 stop following the path that all of his teachers and, and other people were putting him on and and kind of find out what works for him and um and he did he identified his strengths and it's kind of you know i i like his story and i like stories like it because there's lots of people that that start down that that 
path and are able to, it's kind of like that light switch I was talking about. Something changes and then they're able to find that that uh, intrinsic motivation. And that's what happens with my brother. And he eventually went on to, to uh, get his degree in electrical engineering, which is probably one of the most um, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, and certainly the electrical is way more difficult. <laughs> uh, I don't know why anyone would want to do it. Um, so, you know, one of the most taxing and difficult uh, degrees to achieve. And so he's really brilliant. Uh, and so it's, it's. But I, I share the story really to to remind people. You know, don't don't just allow the world around you to determine your your trajectory. You know, take it upon yourself. Um, so. Uh, so that's just on, uh, what I was talking about my, my brother. Yeah, thank, th thanks for sharing. Moving on, another great one you talk about in the book is the, the four-way test. So this is specifically how we can train ourselves in integrity. And one way is the four-way test. And it's something you learn about becoming um, joining the Rotary Club. And, and that is number one, is it the truth? Number one. Number two is, is it fair to all those concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And then fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned. Can you talk a little bit about the four-way test? Well, it, it's, um, you know, if anyone who's a Rotarian, the, the, you know, it's really encouraged to, and often it's recited at meetings, for example, and, and it's about, you know, interactions and business decisions in particular. And I, I talk about it in the book how it's a bit of a paradox because, you know, true integrity kind of comes from within. But you can also, I, I would say it's a reminder more than anything to kind of, it's a litmus test. You know, when you're about to make decisions, when you're about to say say something, when you're about to um, strike a deal, you know, kind of go through those. And they don't, it doesn't have to be those four, but, it, you know, those are pre a pretty good start, you could say. Um, and then I elaborate more on the first. Is it the truth? And, and you know, why that's so important. And, and, you know, the people I know that kind of tout the innocence of their little white lies. And it, it's... the there's the problem with that is they tend to take a, a similar moral stance when it comes to more you know more important issues but also it's exhausting because then you have to kind of um prop up those little white lies with other little white lies to continue them all but the worst part is psychologically it it kind of prevents you from actually achieving the the the, re the results that your lies are trying to fabricate for you anyway right and so uh so anyway so there's a lot of different reasons why i i think it's in, th th that's important um and that's just the first point um certainly there's about the the mutual benefits is is important as well yeah absolutely and it's, it's a great breakdown in the book you also talk about the sort of accountable mentality and the difference between a victim mentality as well so what that means is you know we either spend our time in you know what was me mentality or we spend our time in accountable mentality and one of my quotes is my fault my fix and what that means is everything in life is your fault up to the point where you can fix it so if you're sad, it's your fix to be happy, meaning like you've got to take it upon yourself. And a victim mentality is blaming, you know, others, making excuses, focusing on problems where, you know, the actions and behaviors of someone that's accountable would be like seeking constructive feedback, you know, accept, accepting reality, approach proactively, embrace challenges, focus on solutions, and take ownership as well. Is there anything you want to add about the difference between victim mentality and accountable mentality? Well, only that it's a mentality shift. And you also, we have to kind of differentiate the victim mentality from true um, victimhood because some people are, you know, are, are, are victims in a lot of different areas. But even when you, you have been a victim, we've all been wronged by people throughout our lives at, at various times. It's, it's rarely, if ever, beneficial to kind of to adopt that victim mentality. It's better to say, look, this, is, this has happened. We can't change the past. Uh, what can I best do at this point to to improve my life, to make things better? And and that's what that mentality shift is all about. You know, there's just so many people that just kind of, um, you know, continuously whine and complain about all the wrongs that have been done to them and society at large and how it's, it, it, it's, it, it's never ending. And, and some of that might be true, but it's not helpful to... to fill your mind with that all, all, all the time. Um, it's about taking 
adopting the the, the accountability, and there, it's it, it's it's connected with responsibility, and that the kind of the the accountability that you assume for for things that happened in your past then becomes your responsibility for doing something about it, and uh, when you're looking at the future, and so that's kind of that connection between accountability, integrity, and responsibility. The, the difference between sort of self talk and dialogue as well, and I'll go through it. So people either like a good a positive self talk of what can I do or I can do it. Um, it will make me better. It's on me. Life has ups and downs, and I can. And sort of victim mentality with self-talk would be, you know, it's not my problem to fix. Life's always against me. Who can I blame? Everyone else has, has it better than me. Why would I even try? Not me. I can't. And the world is out to get me as well. So as you said before, it's a difference in perspectives. Sometimes we just need to flush the toilet. You know, people looking in the toilet bowl, you know, there might be something in the toilet. You just got to flush the toilet. You know, move on. It's, it's that. It's, it's just that self-talk as well. So yeah, thank you for expanding that as well. You also talk about in the book, strengthening your autobiography as well. And, and imagine writing your autobiography, including all the details. You know, this is sort of a mental litmus test in terms of maintaining your own self-respect. And would you be proud to read read about myself as well? Do you want to talk about the power of sort of autobiography and strengthening that? Well, thinking that through, because, you know, your relationship with yourself is the most important relationship. And, and that's what that chapter is all about. You can kind of, and it's it's pretty tempting, I would say, to to kind of, you know, um, lie and cheat in order to, to get ahead. And, and you look around at a lot of the people that, you know, seem to be getting ahead and often they aren't, you know, don't have a particularly good moral stance. And so you could say, well, what's the, you know, what's the point? Uh, but in the long run, it, it matters, your relationship with yourself. And a lot of people have just degraded that relationship over the years. And it, it's one moral blunder, blunder after another. And so um, if you want to be able to kind of look back, uh, because when you talk about your own autobiography, a lot of it, I mean, you know yourself, per, you know, or at least you know, especially the, 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 the bad things that you do in life. And so now others might not know about those things and you can certainly do your best to try to hide them. Um, but it, it degrades your, your um, moral, your relationship with your, yourself. And, um, and that's, you know, that, that's what that chapter is about. It's, you don't want to look back and, and, and kind of hate yourself or, or, or um, you know, you want to be able to look back and say, look, I had it tough. I had different things, challenges came in my life, but you know, I took the high road and, um, and I can live with myself. And I think that's pretty important. Yeah. Moving on, you talk about summit six, which is the summit of self resilience. And you talk about the story of the South face of Everest. What is the South face of Everest? Uh, well, the South face is just above camp four. So we're just, at, we're at, uh, 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters and so you're in the death zone at that point where there's not enough oxygen to support life your body's just completely continuing to degrade and um, basically our cells normally are dying all the time in the death zone your cells are dying but they're not being regenerated and normally they are being regenerated and so uh, now that particular analogy or story that i i start that chapter with um <laughs> is it was the cumulative effect of all the different challenges that were thrown at us. We're deathly ill at that point because of the um, the altitude weakens your immune system, and we got these all of us basically these awful sicknesses. We also hadn't slept because we it's eight hours climb from camp three to camp four, but then we head out that evening with no rest and no sleep on our twelve hour summit attempt, and that's just one way. And so. Um, and so we haven't slept, but then it was a blizzard <laughs> through the night. So we're, we're climbing through the night because it, we want to arrive in, at the summit at the, in, the, in the daylight. But then the blizzarding snow on the ropes would fill in little teeth of the ascender units we were using. And so our only safety backup device was, was failing us. Um, and we had these tiny little headlamps trying to illuminate our way. And it was just that, that, that what did I say, uh, accumulation of, of challenges. Um, it seemed like there was not much else that mountain could throw at us. And I mean, everything that could possibly go wrong had gone wrong. But then we had to realize, but this is our current reality. How can we work within our current reality, pick ourselves back up and continue forward? And that's really what resilience is all about. Finding that way of picking yourself back up and, and continuing on when you're, when you're thrown off course. 
Yeah, and you talk about, you know, resilience is sort of recoiling and, and rebounding after these these particular things as well. Moving on, you talk about a couple of things which I like, which is insert the yet, which is, you know, what is inserting the yet? What does that mean to you? Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of people say, well, I can't do this because of this, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm not skilled enough, or I'm not educated enough, and... Um, you know, there's there are really excuses for not taking on things. Well, I would say people that are resilient um, tend to insert the yes into those same sentences. I'm not skilled enough yet. I'm not uh, educated enough yet. And then they go out and they get the skills and then they get or they get the education. Um, and so it's inserting that in your in internal dialogue whenever you um, have some sort of reason why you can't accomplish that, which you know you should. Um, insert the yet, figure out what you know what you actually need to do to, to get yourself to a, to a position mentally, physically, emotionally, where you're able to uh, actually make it a reality. And I would say all, all you know any well, we use the word high achiever in, in life and you know those we read about in history books and all of that. I mean, it, they all started with with lots of reasons why they weren't they weren't able to make it work they weren't able to make that invention work they weren't able to to um you know run the marathon in that time or whatever it is but they just said look i'm not there there yet Here, here's some reasons why i haven't been able to do it what can i change in order to get there and um and so that's just one of the the strategies that i share in that in that chapter yeah absolutely i love that that three letter word which is yet because life is all about becoming and you know if we had everything now then there'll be nothing yet to get so I, I do like insert the yet and last one you talk about summit uh, number seven which is a summit of self-actualization you talk about sort of writing your first book getting your life in order as well but i like to talk about sort of the power of going beyond the comfort zone and then growing into that growth th zone as well do you want to talk about summit seven the summit of self-actualization well it's a lot more comfortable i would say <laughs> to to live and operate within your comfort zone. And that's why it's tempting to just do that and never take that step out uh, outside. But it's not a fulfilling life and stagnation kind of sets in, you, in your life because we're, we're partially wired to overcome some sort of challenge or adversity. And if you just have none, then you, um, in, in some ways it's a, it's a circle back to what I talk about in the, in the beginning of the book where one of the things that makes life worth living is how we work through the different challenges. And in the absence of any kind of challenge, um, you know, it just wouldn't be a meaningful life. And so, um, and so that's really what, what, what that chapter is about in, in the, the, the self-actualization. I got off topic a little bit there. I forget. What was your original question? No, it's all right. It was just talking about Summit 7, uh, self-actualization as well. But even moving on, the last part, you talk about sort of part three, your climb and climbing your own mountains. And you share some real touching stories about the, your, your son as well. I'm not sure if you want to uh, touch on that and talking about sort of the, your climb and start climbing now. So it's sort of to, to, to cap off the podcast and the book. But... Yeah, talking about your own challenges and your own mountains to climb. Yeah, well, I started talking about my son, Oakland. I have three children, but my, my middle child uh, was diagnosed with uh, Down syndrome. And so, um, you know, I talk a little bit, you know, he's, he's had challenges in, in life and, and will have more. But um, I think it's, it's, you know, why I start that, challenge, that, that chapter with that is, you know, he's, everyone has... Some, some sort of challenge or, or in, in some much more than others. And it's easy to, to say, well, no one has the, the challenges I face. And here, here's the reason why I could never do it, it because, you know, this is me. And um, we've often, you know, he's still pretty young, but, uh, but we've kind of taken, my wife and I have, have taken that uh, approach, similar approach to all the strategies that I've shared throughout the book. You know, this is, a, a reality the reality how can we work within this reality and you know kind of um allow him to be the best he can be and we're, we're certainly already trying to instill that with uh in him and i think that's all you can do as, as parents is is encourage that and encourage uh, your kids to kind of find find their own you know whatever challenges they have in life um and we've done that with their two daughters as well but um 
but it's you know it, it's changed the trajectory of our life a little bit but we haven't really allowed it you know you know at first we it was pretty you know you want the best for your children and so when there's these glass ceilings that are there are what do I call them? Thrust upon them. It's it's you know it's pretty hard to to accept that. But but then we've and it, it, it's been amazing to to really see him develop and and keep up with his sisters and, and parents and and uh, the fulfillment we get out of life is, is not is kind of how we we react and work through these. The, the same challenges can be can be. Um, presented to two different people and one it will cripple and they'll get bitter and 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 another will embrace it and figure out how to make make the most of it and that that's kind of the theme throughout the the, the whole book and that's why i started that chapter with with um uh, with that uh that story about oakland mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks for sharing, Alan. A really, um, really touching story there. And yeah, thank you for writing the book too. And I know you've written two books. Is there is there maybe a third in the future coming out, or is there anything you're working on in the future? Uh, it's hard to say. I've been, I have been pondering it. It's taken me. I mean, the, both of those books took me five years of of writing. It's quite a journey. It's an Everest in itself putting putting them together. And so I I I have snippets of articles and things that I've that I've written and I've, I've been pondering you know what would be best but no I really don't have anything concrete I'll kind of see where um what direction I, I go in life it'll probably be another partially psychologically focused book um and probably I'll tie it with adventure I mean that's why you know in order to for messages to be to stick with people and to to um, be interesting enough to to continue on, you kind of need that. And even when I attend conferences, you know, I like listening to speakers that, you know, have some practical takeaways for me, but also have have integrated it into some sort of uh, emotional story that I can really make that connection with. Otherwise, it falls on deaf ears. So, of course, of course. Now, where can people find uh, the book, buy the book, and and follow you socially as well? Uh, where would that be? Well, it's available all over the place, but certainly Amazon and um, and I don't know the, the the book all the bookstores you have over there, but it's in North America, like Barnes and Noble and Chapters and all the big uh, big stores. Um, you can certainly on my website uh, www.alanmallory.com. It's just A L A N. It's spelled it, <laughs> some people spell it a few different ways, but um, there's a monthly insight that I send out, which is really a psychological focused insight with some uh, aspect of adventure it's free you can just sign up on, on my website if you're interested uh, in that and if you do end up reading the book uh, please send me an email and, and uh, I enjoy hearing how it how it affects people and hopefully it improves your life awesome awesome one last question before we go if you had an opportunity for like a, a 15 second Super Bowl commercial uh, with a message that you want to share what would that message be Set, set lofty goals in your life. Don't let the challenges that are, are, are thrown at you hold you down um, and continue making incremental improvements uh, until you've become the, the person that you're happy with. And um, so, anyway, was that 15 seconds? <laughs> yeah, that'd be perfect. Could you imagine that? He's like in the middle of like the news or something where someone comes on and just gives a little 15 second bit on, on life. That would, you know, that, that would be great instead of a Pepsi commercial or a car ad as well. So anyway, that'd be cool. Alan, thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. To my audience out there, go out and uh, buy the book, Summit of Self, The Seven Peaks of Personal Growth. Check out Alan. And yeah, thank you for sharing your story and keep doing what you're doing and uh, appreciate all the work you've done uh, in the past as well. So again, thanks for being a great guest. My pleasure. Thanks very much.